Right, phosphenes are two electron donors. Phosphorus is in group five of the periodic table, has five valence electrons. Three of those are used to make the phosphorus carbon bonds of your alkyl ligand. The other two are a lone pair, which is available to donate to the transmission metal center. So a phosphine ligand is a two electron donor. Why do organomechanic chemists love phosphine ligands so much? Because of their almost infinite variability and flexibility. If you have a phosphine ligand, you can play all sorts of games with it. You can vary its electronic properties. How do you do this, of course? You change the R group. You can vary its electronic properties. You can make it a stronger donor. You can make it a better acceptor. Well, you can do the opposite, can't you? What's the best electron withdrawing group that you're familiar with? Fleury. So you would put fluorine substituents. If you wanted to make your ligand as good an acceptor as possible, you would substitute in as many fluorine atoms as possible. Those are just the electronic properties. By playing with the R group here, you can completely change the size of a ligand. So we can mess around with the electron deficiency of the metal center simply by putting in very large ligands. When you're talking about a phosphine ligand, you have to consider, first of all, the obvious. The obvious is this lone pair of electrons on the phosphorus. Here's sigma donation of a lone pair of electrons, the classic bonding interaction between a ligand and a transition metal center. Is a phosphine ligand a pi acceptor ligand? Phosphine ligands do act as pi acceptors. And so if you go back way into the literature, people used to think that the orbital responsible for accepting electron density was actually a d orbital on the phosphorus. If you do the molecular orbital calculations, you can find that there are, of course, phosphorus carbon bonds. And if you have a phosphorus carbon sigma bond, then you will have a sigma star orbital. And in the case of phosphines, these sigma star orbitals have symmetry that looks approximately like this. Okay? So this is a sigma star, sigma star orbital on the phosphine ligand. So it is antibonding, this orbital is antibonding with respect to the phosphorus carbon bonds. And as you can see, this orbital here has exactly the right symmetry to overlap with one of these metal d orbitals that is occupied. So this is an unoccupied orbital on the phosphine. This is an occupied orbital on the transition metal center. So you can get electron don density donated from the metal d orbitals into the sigma star orbital on the phosphine. So this is data for our phosphine complex nickel tricarbonyls. The more electron density on the metal, the more backbonding, the more occupancy of the carbon-oxygen antibonding orbital, this will make it weaker, so those should appear at lower frequency. So the lower the frequency, the more electron density on the metal. The most electron donating ligands, which we've already sort of guessed at, would be t-butyl phosphine ligands. These are the most electron donating ligands, and they give rise to the lowest frequencies. As you go down this group, we're producing ligands of our less good donors. Trifluorophosphine ligand is the most electron drawing, withdrawing one we've got in our series here, and this gives rise to the highest stretching frequency because there's the least amount of backbonding. How do you assess steric properties? It was very easy for us to assess the electronic properties because we could measure them directly using the carbon-oxygen bond strength as our probe. First of all, you need to consider what angles, what parameters are you actually going to measure. So what we do is we measure an angle not to the carbon, phosphorus, carbon, but we angle, measure an angle from the metal to the outsides of the substituent. And if you measure that angle from the metal to the outsides of the substituents here, then that is given the name Tolman's cone angle. 